All right, you guys can sit down now. <laughs> I was a teacher for like 27 years, so I'm going to try to exercise some good classroom management tonight. <clears throat> well, it's a blessing to be here, a uh, blessing to be with you guys. This is like, I was kind of nervous, but really this is like family. Uh, we're amongst family, amongst loved ones, so um, appreciate the prayers, though. Um, this is new for me. But I uh, just felt like God put it on my heart to step out in faith. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I um, just want to be obedient to him. So um, let's just open prayer. Lord, um, God, as we were worshiping, Lord, inviting your Holy Spirit here, we just pray that your spirit would continue to abide in this place, Father. Please fill me with your spirit, Lord. May, may every word that I speak be from you, Father. Just have your way here tonight, Lord, and just do... A work in our hearts, we know that your word does not return to you void, and just pray that your word would go forth in truth, that it would be alive in our hearts, Lord, that we would just learn from you tonight, Lord. So we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We just want to give all glory to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, we're looking at Psalm 33, if you have your Bibles, and um, I'm just going to go over verses 1 through 7 tonight. It's uh, 22 verses, and it seemed like a lot to cover, so especially being new to this. But let me read it to you. Psalm 33 reads, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. So this is um, a psalm of praise. Many of the psalms are. Uh, this one is not attributed to David. Uh, many believe that maybe he wrote it, but in cases where he's not credited, they attribute it to the psalmist. So I'll be referring to the psalmist as we go through this. So verse 1 reads, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. So this psalm begins with a call, even a command, an imperative to rejoice. And the word rejoice comes from the Hebrew word renan, which can mean to shout for joy, to cry out, to give a ringing cry or to sing. And all these definitions, there's this idea of not holding anything back in the way that we express ourselves. So as we look around, where do we see this kind of unrestrained expression of joy and emotion? Um, one of the places that I've experienced it is um, Dodger Stadium. Um, it's really something. You go to a game, and I, you, you can't imagine the energy that's uh, established sometimes. So I kind of wanted to paint a picture, if you will. Imagine Dodgers make it again, or did, I don't know if they made it last year, to the World Series, and maybe we're playing the Yankees because it's been a while. It's game seven, bottom of the ninth inning, right? Um, we're down seven to three, um, two outs, um, bases loaded. Let's say Bellinger comes up. He's uh, at bat. So full count, three and two, We're, and you're there, right? You're in this stadium, and he hits a grand slam. Can you, I mean, it, it would be hard to describe that kind of elation, right? The energy that would be um, generated. Um, I know I would be freaking out, right? Um, and many people in here as well. Or, you know, sometimes people respond to celebrities or rock concerts, right? Um, if you've seen footage of the Beatles in concert, like the audience is in hysterics, right? And I think the Beatles eventually they stopped performing live, right? Because they complained that nobody could hear the music. They couldn't even hear themselves playing because the screaming was so loud. Now, I, I don't think God's calling us to hysteria or to get pumped up emotions just for the sake of the emotion, but instead that we would have an earnest zeal for the Lord, right? We somehow reserve those kinds of expressions to areas away from God. Why not express that kind of intensity towards the God of the universe? Right? 
I believe that's the kind of rejoicing that the psalmist is calling us to express to the Lord. Um, Psalm 33 reads again, rejoice in the Lord. So where does our rejoicing lie? It's not in the Dodgers as much as we may love them, or the Beatles as much as I love them. No, our greatest expression of rejoicing should be in our great and mighty God, the Lord Almighty. He is the source of our rejoicing. He is our reason to sing. He is the one that brings joy to our hearts. He is our Savior, the one who gave everything for us, laying down his life for us. As we focus on him and who he is and what he has done, rejoicing should just flow from our hearts, right? In Philippians 4.4, Paul instructs the church to, quote, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So when are we to rejoice? Always, Always, right? He repeats it again for emphasis. Again, I will say rejoice. This is something we should be doing every day, right? It's not a subtle point. Rejoicing should be central to our lives. We should always have a reason to rejoice in him. So are we rejoicing? If not, well, what keeps us rejoicing? Amen if you are. Um, Maybe it's because our focus is on ourselves, right? We can kind of focus on our own needs, our hurts, our feelings, our circumstances. Or maybe we just get caught up in the busyness of life, right? Our to-do lists, television, Facebook, YouTube, social media, our hobbies, which I'm guilty of. Um, Or, you know, lately our focus is on what's going on in the world. There's a lot going on in the news, and if we focus on that, we're certainly not going to feel like rejoicing. So if our focus is in the wrong place on ourselves, our circumstances, it's hard to rejoice. But if we keep our focus on him, even in the midst of this crazy time, we have a reason to rejoice, right? Our hearts can be at peace and rest as it continues in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. It's kind of interesting that Paul begins this section, this final exhortation to the Philippians, with a command to rejoice, and he concludes with this promise of peace, a peace that transcends all understanding. So there seems to be a connection between rejoicing and peace. Rejoicing can bring a peace that, in many ways, it just doesn't make sense to the world, right? Uh, The world's peace is based on their circumstance. If everything's going well, I'm prosperous, I'm healthy, I'm successful, I have peace. But the peace that God gives us is based on him, not our circumstances. Our circumstances may change, but God does not change. And I just find that so amazing and the freedom that we have in that, right? It doesn't matter what we're going through, what we're facing we have that solid foundation and we can just have that peace and that rejoicing regardless of our circumstances. Uh, One of the definitions of rejoicing that I mentioned is to sing. In fact, the NIV reads, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Here at CCLX, we've uh, had praise and worship be just a central part of what we do here. It's valuable, it's seen as important. And it's a blessing that we can use our voices, right, to sing joyfully to the Lord, remembering that our reason for singing is always Him. Honestly, there may be times when we don't feel like singing or rejoicing, right? Now, if we rejoice only based on our feelings, we may never choose to sing joyfully to the Lord. But again, the call to rejoice is a command. It's an imperative. Hebrews 13, 15 reads, Therefore, By him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we read here that sometimes praise is a sacrifice. It's a letting go of our feelings, our burdens, our circumstances, and praising him in spite of those things, right? I don't know if you've had the experience where you may enter into church and worship begins, and you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, feel downcast, depressed. But in spite of that, you just choose. You make a decision to focus on the Lord, right? As you put your eyes on the Lord, you begin to see his majesty, his greatness, his power, his might, right? What what happens? We are lifted up. We are just inspired. We are set free. 
and we are just filled with peace and joy because our focus has shifted away from ourselves and our circumstances onto him. Uh, I think it's important here to remember that our purpose in praise and worship or rejoicing is to please him. We don't enter into worship for what we can get out of it or that we are seeking some kind of experience. We don't want our responses to be like, oh, well, worship was great. The band was amazing. The singing was amazing. I got so much out of worship. But that our focus is always on him, to honor him. And I mean, it's a blessing that we are blessed through worship, right? But as we enter in, let our focus always be on the Lord and our intent to please him. So still on verse 1, <laughs> rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. So who is called to rejoice? It tells us here, the righteous. The word righteous comes from the Hebrew word sadiq. It can mean those who are just, lawful, right in one's cause, right in character and conduct, or one justified or vindicated by God. So who are the righteous? Are we made righteous through the law, through our ability to follow God's commands? I mean, God does call us to holiness, but even our best efforts can never be enough. Our righteousness in our own strength is seen as filthy rags in God's sight. Thankfully, Romans 5.21 says, He has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we are made righteous only through Christ, in him and through him alone. What an amazingly precious gift that his righteousness is imputed to us. We don't deserve it. We are unworthy of such an amazing gift, but his great love and mercy has been poured out upon us. We have every reason to rejoice because of this great gift. We are his people. We are his children. We have been saved from darkness and brought into his marvelous light. We should be rejoicing in this. And when we truly understand what we've been saved from, our hearts can't help but rejoice, right? Verse 1 continues, <clears throat> For praise from the upright is beautiful. This tells us that our praise is a beautiful thing. Even though we live in this fallen world, there is still so much beauty to see, right? Uh, in his creation, his creation speaks of his existence. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. His creation gives us a glimpse just a glimpse of his beauty, of his reality, of who he is, his majesty. He is the author of beauty, and our God himself is beautiful. Psalm 27, 4 reads, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in his temple. We're going to spend eternity just beholding the beauty of the Lord, trying to comprehend his greatness, his majesty, his splendor, right? His beauty. When we do encounter the beauty of his handiwork, how does it affect us? I know that um, we're blessed, right? We may be inspired or encouraged or refreshed, right? There's so much beauty in nature. Um, it's just so renewing to get away from the city once in a while and just to see his, his creation. Um, Jason and I are into photography, and we've, been, we've gone on some excursions to see some night skies. And when you get away from the city, away from air pollution and light pollution, and you see the sky at night, it just takes your breath away, right? You can't even imagine the billions of stars up there. They're there all the time if we went outside, we looked up, they're there, we just can't see them because of all the pollution. But that just gives us like this little glimpse of his infinite nature, his greatness, right? And we're blessed by seeing that. Um, I was reading this week in Psalm 147, it says, he determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. When you look up and you can see all the stars and you see those billions of stars to imagine that God knows each and every one and he has a name for each and every one. That's truly awesome. When we choose to rejoice in him, to sing praise to his name, 
we can bring something of beauty to the Lord. Our rejoicing, our praise is beautiful in his sight. We can actually bless him. Can you imagine? We can bring something of beauty for God to enjoy. Our praise and rejoicing are beautiful in his sight. He has given us everything, right? Every good gift, every breath we take is a good gift from our Heavenly Father. It's so amazing that we can give something back to him. Our praise brings joy to our Lord. Verse 2 reads, Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings or six strings. Here, the psalmist has given us some guidelines for our rejoicing. The Lord calls us to rejoice with the use of musical instruments. He could have called us to just worship with our voices, but he instructs us to use these instruments in rejoicing. In the Bible, we see the use of the lute, the harp, the lyre, cymbals, trumpets. Uh, so we see stringed instruments, wind instruments, percussion instruments, all used by God's people to make a joyful noise, right? So in our time, we have guitars, stringed instruments, drum sets, still have trumpets, saxophones, keyboards. Um, I'm just so blessed that God included this. I, I love to play the guitar. It's been a passion of mine most of my life, and there's just something truly special about playing an instrument. It's just such a joy. It's been almost like a companion to me throughout my life, right? And I'm just so thankful that I'm able to make music. Isn't God good to bless his children th this way, right? If you play an instrument, you know what a blessing it is. Musical instruments are a joy to play, but also to listen to, right? Now, as much as I appreciate great music, and I love the Beatles, and I love jazz, but something really special happens when music is dedicated to the Lord. It becomes more than just music. So I wanted to share a little story. Um, one of my guitar heroes is this guy named Phil Kage, who's a Christian guitarist. And he's considered by many to be one of the world's greatest guitarists. And um, when I was in my early 20s, I went to go see him in concert. And he was actually playing at the high school that I went to, which was very cool. And I was kind of backslidden at the time. Um, I was raised as a Christian, so I've been saved since I was eight years old. But I was going through a time of questioning and maybe some doubt. And I went to this concert because I just loved Phil Kage, and I went with a friend who was in a band with me at the time, and he wasn't a believer. And um, we just started playing, and I, of course, he's just like so great, and he's got this amazing voice, and I was just enjoying the music. And that in one point during the concert, he started playing this really beautiful song that I loved, and he was singing, and then there was like an instrumental break where he was just soloing on the guitar. And he just had his eyes closed and his head tilted back. And the notes that began to come out of his guitar, it was like God was speaking to me. They were more, it was more than just music. It was like I heard God's voice. And I didn't expect to have that kind of experience. Um, yeah, that was just one example of how instruments can be such a powerful expression of rejoicing. And I can testify to it. Uh, verse 3 reads, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. So there's this idea of a new song. I think um, this speaks to the idea that there should be a freshness to our worship, right? It's so easy to fall into a rut. Um, even as uh, a team, we can kind of come up and get in a routine of just going through the songs, but I think God always wants more. That um, you know, we can get into a rut even as church attendees, right? We come to church, we'll sing a few songs, we listen to the message, we'll sing another song, and then we're on our way. But I think there should always be that sense of excitement, anticipation of what God wants to do, this joy as we gather together, this sense of newness, right, each time we gather. And it kind of reminded me of how, like, the Word can be the same way. It's alive, right? Uh, think about verses that you've heard like your whole life. You've heard them a million times. You've heard them preached on a million times. And then sometimes God will just bring up this new truth, right? It's like same words, but this new truth. I mean, it just, it's alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I think also a new song can actually mean a new song, right? 
His joys are new every morning. God never runs out of ideas. He is infinite. So there must be infinite ways of expressing our rejoicing through song. Sometimes I don't think it needs to be like a song that's arranged, written out, and recorded. I think um, sometimes I'd encourage you, like, just sing a song to the Lord from your heart. It doesn't have to be sound great. It doesn't have to have the greatest melody, but that you just sing in your, in your home. Just sing out what's on your heart, like praying to him, but using your voice to sing those things to him, that rejoicing. Um, try it. Um, it also says to play skillfully with a shout of joy. So as we serve the Lord with instruments, we're called to play skillfully. So how does one acquire and develop skill? Well, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes practice, it takes dedication. I've often wondered why many of the world's greatest musicians are out in the world when they should be in the church, right? Shouldn't his people be creating the best music, striving for excellence, for the glory of God? Are we as people willing to put in the effort and time to be the very best for the Lord. I know that I'm guilty sometimes. I'm, when I used to play in bands, we would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. We have a show we're going to play. You just want to put forth your best foot, right? How much more should we be bringing excellence for the glory of God? I think many musicians are driven by the pursuit of their own glory, right? They want fame and honor, so they work and they, to become great. They want all the attention. But again, how much more should we be working and putting forth the effort for God's glory? We have a personal relationship, a direct connection with the living God who created music, right? We should be creating the very best music on the planet. Um, throughout history, um, much of the greatest music was coming from the church. I did some research on Bach, who's considered by many to be the world's greatest composer. He had a deep abiding faith in the Lord. So did Beethoven, Handel, even Mozart, as crazy as his life was. Um, you know, thankfully, there are some truly amazing musicians who've de dedicated their gifts to the Lord, right? I mentioned Phil Kage, Um And he's been such an inspiration to me. I mean, there are times where it was like his music that kept my faith alive. Um, and even though he's so esteemed and honored, when you see him, he's so humble. He just wants to give glory to God, and it's just so beautiful to see that. But may we as his people, whether it's in worship or whatever we do, may we strive to bring our best for him, to be excellent for his glory. Verse 4 reads, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. And these verses give us further reason to rejoice, right? For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. I think if ever we need an anchor of hope, some foundation of truth to lean on and to look to and stand upon, that time is now, right? We live in this age of countless opinions and views on everything under the sun, and most of what is counted as truth is one's subjective feelings on a matter, right? I feel this, I feel that, it must be true. And what are the results of this kind of thinking? Well, we see the evidence around us, right? We see society just basically crumbling around us. And we can't even begin to believe the things that we see, right? We're just incredulous. Uh, I just hear stories every day. It's like, I mean, it's almost becoming to the point where we expect to hear these kinds of things. So why did this happen? I think we as a country, as a people, we have abandoned God's word, his foundation, his truth. But what a blessing to know that God has chosen to reveal his truth to us in his word. His truth does not change. It does not adapt to society. It doesn't try to remain progressive or um, hip. It's, it's his truth that never changes. Isn't it amazing that these ancient words, some like going back thousands of years, still have such relevance all these years later, right? The superficial trappings of the world and lifestyles may change, but the inner workings of the human heart, they're the same. They don't change. And God knew this to be true. 
The truths that he chose to include in his word, he knew would have eternal relevance and significance. And that's why I'm so grateful to be at this church, part of this body where God's word is still held up and honored in spite of the apostasy that we see in, in today's church, right? We see so many churches compromising God's truth, again, to stay relevant, to be socially conscious um, in the world's view. Everything we need to live is in his word. Second Peter 1.3 reads, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We have his word, we have his very great promises, and they truly are precious more and more in these challenging times. Verse 5 um, continues, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. God loves what is right. He is a champion of justice. When we speak of righteousness, we can think of it as a vertical relationship between God and man. That we are walking as his people in holiness and uprightness. He loves right living. He loves godly living. He loves when his children choose rightly and abide in his will. When we say no to ourselves, to, our, to, the, to sin and our flesh, and we say yes to him. This is pleasing in his sight. He loves this. Justice is more about the horizontal relationship with men with one another. And I think God put something in our hearts that desires to see justice, right? We are indignant when we see the wicked getting away with their evil deeds without receiving the penalty they deserve. And there's something satisfying when we see justice carried out against those who have done wrong or hurt others. Even David, when he was confronted by Nathan, with the story of the poor man's lamb being taken by the rich man, David was filled with indignation, right? With that wrong, the injustice. There are many psalms that express us the woes of seeing the wicked get away with their evil deeds without evidence of them having to pay. But we need to remember that it is in God's hand to see justice carried out. And when it comes to vengeance, that it belongs to the Lord. He will make all things right in the end. Romans 12, 19 reads, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We know that in his time, righteousness and justice will prevail, and we can take comfort in that. <laughs> Verse 5 continues, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Now, we look around here in August 2022. It may be difficult to think that the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We see so much that is evil, so much that's wrong. We see such a deterioration of truth, goodness, and morality. How can the earth be full of God's goodness? Well, at times it is veiled by the darkness of this world. But remember, his light is greater. Like it says in Romans, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. If you are feeling burdened and just fatigued with the bad news and the decline that you see around you, again, speaking of his creation, get away. Go to the mountains. Go to the desert. Even go to the beach and just watch a sunset. And there's, it's just renewing to see his creation. His goodness does fill the world. Verse 6, as we close... By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 7 reads, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Since God created the world, he created it with his mouth. He just spoke, and it was. All the celestial beings, the universe, just by speaking it into existence. He keeps the boundaries of the oceans and the waters in their place. He is holding all things together even as we speak by his word. He spoke and it was. His word is powerful. 
and he has given us his word, right? In written form. Think of the power that's in these pages. The power to transform, to heal, to resurrect, to set free. And this is just yet another reason to rejoice in him, right? His word brings change to our lives. As we stand in awe of his greatness tonight, who he is, his majesty, his power, let us not hold back in our praise. May we learn to be unafraid to express our worship to the Lord in rejoicing and shouting even, crying out to the Lord with all that's within us. Amen? Amen. All right. Lord, we just thank you that we have a reason to rejoice, Lord, always, because you are good, because our hope is in you, Lord. Just put that rejoicing, that, that song in our hearts, Lord. May we sing a new song to you each and every day. May we rejoice because we are your children, because you are good, because you are mighty, Lord. Not because our circumstances are good or our life is good, Lord, but because you are who you are. And that's reason enough always to rejoice, Father. So continue to do a good work in our hearts. Just help us to rejoice throughout our week. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother.